How are we doing? Ooh, how are we doing? Can you hear me? No distortion? Okay. Right, uh, as soon as I press this button, it's going to give me 10 minutes, and you're going to go like this if I get really close to it and it doesn't look like I've finished. No, okay. Um, I don't have any balloons. I've got no props. I've got no pictures of me writing or drawing. Uh, I've done the intro so we can move back. Um, okay, I want to start with this image because um, I'm going to try and transport you back to a time... Um, I suppose many years before many of you were born, but your parents, I'm sure, were around. Um, it's a story that was set um, at this point in 1964. Um, that happens to be, if you want to do the maths, the year of my birth. But it's an important moment in the history um, of this country, actually, learning to read. So I, I, I want to introduce the heroes of this story. Um, and they're two characters brother and sister, um, beautiful siblings, Peter and Jane. Uh, so they were first introduced to a waiting world in 1964. Um, this is Peter and Jane. They were the creation of Lady Bird Books. They were the creation of um, two main illustrators, both living in different parts of the country. Uh, try and imagine. This is going to take some deep thinking from this generation, trying to imagine a world pre-digital. It really existed. So uh, two illustrators, Harry Wingfield, Martin Aitchinson, in different parts of the country using different models, created um, a set of 36 books based around the adventures of Peter and Jane. And these two heroes were responsible for teaching generations to read. Peter and Jane lived in a world that was very safe and very simple. It was a world where mummy shopped on the high street, uh, where children were definitely white and very middle class. It was a world where Christianity was the only religion. And it was a world where kids were wholesome and well-behaved. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment because you can see this couple of kids singing hymns from books that they're on the cover of. <laughs> and what, what's rather fantastic about Ladybird Books is the kind of self-referencing. So if you go back through the back catalogue of over 800 books from the golden era of Ladybird, you'll see many times that Ladybird feature inside Ladybird Books. And I think that's kind of confusing for small kids, but I think it's a great marketing ploy. So kids were wholesome and well-behaved, a world, as I, once, as, I, as I just mentioned, that was once pre-digital, so before that thing called the internet. And rainy Sundays meant hobbies and crafts. And I'm sure, hands up if you have a sibling, a brother or sister, keep your hands up if you didn't argue. Okay, I, th I see one hand up. So the children in Ladybird books, it was an idyllic existence. They got on well with their siblings. There was no fighting, no arguing. Uh, it was a world where science was an adventure. Um, and I'll pause for a moment to tell you a very quick story. These two, um, on the left, one of the key people behind Ladybird books was a chap called Douglas Keane. I don't have time to go into who he was, but he was really um, the man behind moving Ladybird. Ladybird was set up in 1915, and when he joined after the Second World War, he was instrumental in moving it more towards educational um, titles. That's his daughter on the left-hand side, um, Jenny. On the right-hand side is uh, Harry Wingfield's son. And the two of them never met until, a, uh, until January, where an exhibition opening, and I'll go into the exhibition at the end of the presentation, um, brought these two together. So I have photographs of the two of them meeting for the first time. So I make that point because whilst they're having this idyllic time, um, having adventures with science, um, enjoying knowledge, the two of them never met. They were comped together by illustrators, in, uh, by an illustrator from a whole set of different references. Um, so where outdoor activities were engaging and physical, and in a world where the people of Britain were res resolutely working class and proud. And Lady Bird was never condescending. Uh, it was a period during the 1960s when we were rebuilding Britain after uh, the, the Second World War. 
um, where little girls aspired to be nurses and little boys aspired to be road makers or pottery makers. So this was a time in Britain's history where the, the, these were occupations. Um, the 1960s, the 1970s, that's when Britain was laying tarmac and building uh, motorways. And it's hard to imagine a publishing company today, an editorial team getting around a table and saying, you know what nine-year-olds need? They need a book about making motorways. But this is what Lady Bird did. Um, you could choose to work on the railways. You could make cars. Um, redundant industries, pretty much, in this country, where working in a hotel was interesting and rewarding. Okay, um, And where nature was absolutely abundant, and the British countryside was a place to discover the natural world. So this was a world where my generation, when we were under 10 years old, we, we didn't leave the country. We went to the countryside. No one went to Europe. That was unheard of. Um, there was no, in this wonderful um, British countryside, there was no environmental threat to nature whatsoever. It was peaceful. It, it was idyllic. And where the stories that we read had morals, there were goodies, there were baddies, and there were tales of good forever triumphing over evil. But it was also a place where our childhood was full of adventure and knowledge, and it was a place where we could turn to Lady Bird books to find out about the world around us. Where kids' books were informative, they were creative, they were educational. and where a generation could turn to these books for answers before, as I said, the dawn of the digital and the internet. They were far simpler times. Um, and I've met many adults that have confessed to going back to their Lady Bird books as adults because they haven't still figured out how a television or a telephone or a computer works. And across um, 24 pages, 24 illustrations, you get the sense of how these things work. Um, so Peter and Jane guided us. They taught us about the world. And so I mentioned there were, there were 36 books in total across three series of 12 books in each series. Um, and as I just mentioned, there were 24 illustrations per book. Um, so I did a quick calculation as I, as I was sat there because I've not actually done it before. There are 864 images across the Peter and Jane books. There's not a single argument. There's uh, nothing untoward happening whatsoever. Um, but here, once again, Lady Bird referencing Lady Bird within a Lady Bird illustration. Um, but Peter and Jane taught us that reading was the key to education. Uh, and very, very simply, um, what Lady Bird did was recognize that commonly repeated words, there were about 24 commonly repeated words, and if you taught children to read using those commonly repeated words, they would remember and pick up how to read. Um, what's really incredible, um, Lady Bird are 100 years old this year. They're still a successful publishing company. Company. The first books were published in 1915. Um, the Peter and Jane Keywords Reading Scheme came to prominence um, in 1964. And to the present day, the estimate is that they've sold 100 million Peter and Jane books worldwide across 70 different countries, which is you know, staggering. It's hard to imagine. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many. Would we get 100 million Lady Bird books in this room? No, I don't think we would. Uh, a huge amount. Um, and to commission those 864 images, um, Lady Bird invested in 1964 the princely sum of 25,000 pounds. I mean, a huge sum of money um, to commission the two illustrators, there were a couple of other, other illustrators involved in the first series, but it, it was, they soon peeled away because they realized the real masters of creating Peter and Jane and, and keeping them um, memorable fell to Harry Wingfield and Martin Aitchinson. But 25K 1964 equates in today's money um, to nearly half a million pounds, 450,000 um, pounds. Hard to imagine. Anyone in here work in children's publishing? Okay, that little row there. Can you imagine a world where you'd spend half a million pounds commissioning illustration? Can the illustrators in here imagine a world where you get that call? No. Okay, so, uh, and in old money, they sold um, for two and six. Is there anyone in the room 
that remembers old money. So two and six was half a crown, and in new money, um, does it, anyone in the room remember past decimalization where we had half penny pieces? Same hands go up, right? Maybe a few more. Um, so in real money, they cost 12 and a half pence, and they stayed that price for 29 years. So, I mean, fascinating facts. A book that sold for 29 years at 12 and a half pence. I can't, I can't think of many other things that have stayed at a fixed price for that long. Um, but Ladybird soon realized that they weren't really heading a zeitgeist. Peter, brilliantly wholesome. Um, I, I mean, I grew up through the 60s and 70s, and me and my mates did not look like this. <laughs> this did not represent the world we lived in. It might have represented the, the, the world we aspired to. Um, Ten years in, after having spent £25,000, Lady Bird realised they were going to have to move with the times, and so they updated Peter and Jane. They needed to look less old-fashioned and more contemporary. Um, <laughs> so Peter's hair grows over his ears, and suddenly I'm there, I'm nine years old, and that looks like me and my mates. He's got a kind of funky sweatshirt on. He's got jeans on. He's out of shorts for the first time. Unthinkable ten years before. Um, Jane... She's allowed for the first time to put on trousers, start wearing plimsolls, and they became real. They became real to our generation. Um, small details, they became a little more urban. The bricks behind Jane, 10 years before, unthinkable. These were country-loving kids. Trips to the shops became more realistic. In, in, the, in the 1960s, a trip to the shops with mummy looked like this. By the 1970s, it looked like this, and mummy's like, get out of the house, here's the shopping list, go and get the shopping done. <laughs> and the two of them become more adventurous. I mean, I love that. Those anoraks, if you're around my age, they were the, they were, you, if you had that anorak, so they were almost like little fashion manuals. Um, but the kids became, um, Jane was allowed finally to be more adventurous. Instead of standing back and admiring Peter's adventures, she's allowed to kind of get involved in them. So here in 1964, here's Peter bravely rescuing a bull from the tree, and here's Jane 10 years later. Well, I'm going to climb up the first branch of the tree and help Peter. So there's some activity that Jane's involved in. And then for the first time, black faces appear, but only as dolls in shops that Jane's choosing. So lots of changes taking place, um, and there's some semblance through the 70s of a changing world that Lady Bird was starting to reflect upon. Uh, what's interesting is Lady Bird still published a keywords reading scheme, and they still use the 1974 illustrations, so you can still go to the shops and buy these books. Um, and well over time, I'm going to speed up. There are two ways to learn more about Lady Bird. I, I think a fascinating subject um, I would say that because I've spent six months of my life kind of dedicated to it. And um, the first is you can take a trip down to Bex Hill, um, which is a place on the south coast that is a little like Lady Bird's World, where um, early closing on a Wednesday, everything's shut five o'clock throughout the week, and nothing happens on a Sunday. But I would say this beautiful modernist piece of artwork, uh, artwork, um, architecture, whether you go for the Lady Bird exhibition there or whether you go to explore this place, do go. Um, once again, Ladybird reference within Ladybird illustrations. Um, I'll briefly whiz through. This is an exhibition that, that we've curated. Myself and Jane Wan, the head of exhibitions at the Delaware, we've create, curated an exhibition that uh, brings together 220 original artworks. I'm very fortunate that I trained in an analog world and made a move to a digital world. I kind of cheesily refer to it as um, BC and AD, before computer, after digital. Um, so to go and see this wonderful artwork and see the talents of these hugely um, well, brilliant illustrators is something to behold. Um, all hand-painted, um, 220 artworks from an archive held at Reading University. Uh, if you're an illustrator, the idea of not getting your artwork back is something to kind of get enraged about. Lady Bird's contracts with illustrators were, were, were almost kind of fascist. Illustrators didn't get the work back. Hence, there's an archive at Reading University of many thousands of artworks. Um, the other great thing about the exhibition is that, as well as the artworks, there are 800 Lady Bird books on display. So you can go there and see people my age and older peering at them saying, oh, I had that one. 
one. Oh, I had that one. Um, so I'm going to finish there. That, the second way of finding out more about um, Ladybird books, and this is a shameless plug for the book I've just written and published last, last, um, <laughs> last month, is uh, pick up this book. At least have a look in the library and the bookshops. Uh, Ladybird by Design. It tracks the full hundred years. And there are many, many, many more stories about what has become a national treasure and was really important um, in educating um, generations of kids through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and for today. Thank you very much for your time.